Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this dissection of the lateral face, we're going to be concerned with a gland which is shown here the parotid gland. A fascia has been removed to expose the gland and if you remember from the cervical dissection that there was a fascia that came up, the superficial investing fascia, yet extends cephalically over the superficial aspect of both the parotid gland and the meseter. It therefore is called the parotidomacenteric fascia. That fascia has been removed and your first assignment then is going to be to identify the peripheral extent of the gland, its duct, and then at the peripheral extensions of the gland, we're going to want to identify certain features, neurovascular ones, which pass through the gland to pass onto the superficial face. We'll begin up here at the anterior border of the ear, and we want to identify one sensory branch which is closely associated with the superficial temporal artery. I should mention to you that since we last dissected, we've injected the vascular supply with a small amount of red acetate, which should help in showing this up for you. These two pass up anteriorly, just in front of the ear, the auriculotemporal nerve and the superficial temporal artery. There will also be a vein associated with this artery. Continuing around the periphery of the gland, we're going to see penetrating and reaching the face fibers of the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, and you should follow these from their point of origin here, the periphery of the gland, to the facial muscle, in this case, obricularis oculi, to show that this, in fact, is the motor supply to these muscles. You can continue around the periphery discovering and following out peripherally the nerves and their branches. I should advise you that when you get down to the area of the angle of the mandible, realize that the seventh cranial nerve, having its origin here, is going to also supply the platysma muscle. Now in this particular specimen, most of the platysma has been removed, but we can see the nerve which was going to supply the platysma at this point. The way to find that is to look between the angle of the mandible and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. That nerve has to pass through that inner space to approach the muscle. Now I'd like to show you how to trace then, after you've traced them peripherally, these branches of the nerve and artery centrally to remove the gland mass and expose the boundaries of the parotid fossa. Here, you can see on this particular head, in this region, is again the parotid gland. Now if we can look in here, at this level, we'll find the nerve that I'd like to show you uh, how to trace it in. Here's the nerve right here, and I'll take and show you how that is exposed at this point. Now, the nerve is here, and the way to expose these to avoid cutting the nerve is to use your scalpel as a probe, work along the nerve, and then incise the gland overlying the nerve. There is nothing which is going to be superficial to this nerve. So in this fashion, you can follow the nerve for a fair distance through the gland without any fear of cutting it. So again, it's a matter of using your scalpel as a probe, working along the nerve, and following it back, cutting the tissues away and upward to follow the nerve. Using this technique, one is able then to carefully follow the neurovascular components through the gland without injuring them and remove the gland from the surrounding structures. If you do that, remove the gland material,
what we'll see now is a situation like this. Here, the gland mass has been totally removed from the parotid gland fossa. Um, again, some points for landmarks. We have the parotid duct, which has been cut here, the angle of the mandible, and passing forward up to the base of the zygoma in this region. When you remove the, con the gland to expose the contents, let's just see what you can find. Superficially, the venous network is most easily found, the retromandibular vein, and its associated branches. The nerves we've already talked about following in. The facial nerve, for example, is shown here. The facial nerve is going to pass into the gland mass and I can show here that, in fact, one can demonstrate a trunk of the facial nerve passing to the stylomastoid foramen at the base of the ear. Now, some of its branches were cut peripherally, but one can still identify this nerve and follow it back. The next vascular component that we want to find is the external carotid artery. The carotid artery, you remember, bifurcated in the carotid sheath. And as it approaches the angle of the mandible, the carotid artery will penetrate the substance of the parotid gland, pass through its fossa, and within it, divide up into its terminal branches. A final nerve consideration is one which we mentioned earlier at the periphery of the gland, the auriculotemporal nerve, and you can follow this back and show its relationships with the fossa. Now that you've traced these features into the gland fossa, the next thing is to understand what are the fascial boundaries that make up the parotid space. The superficial fascia we've talked about, the parotidomasseteric fascia overlying both the parotid gland and the masseter, that has obviously been removed here. However, one feature of that superficial layer does exist still and can be seen at the angle of the mandible. If I extend the sternocleidomastoid in this fashion, you will notice in this region a tract of fascia which passes from the angle to the sternocleidomastoid. It has been called the angular tract of Eisler. I prefer a more functional name for it, and that is that this tract separates two major salivary glands, the submandibular gland located here, and then, of course, the parotid gland, which did fill this fossa prior to its removal. It's been called then an interglandular septum as a more functional name for it. Now, how do we get the deep boundaries of the parotid fossa? Basically, the parotid fossa extends from the styloid process, which is located deep at the base of the ear in this region, and it then is going to pass posteriorly and out and anteriorly and forward. If you consider the posterior wall first, it spans from the styloid process then to incorporate three muscles the sternocleidomastoid superficially, the posterior belly of the digastric, which is swinging across in this region, and still deeper, a digastric-associated muscle, the stylohyoid, will pass. The fascia spanning then from the styloid process deep across this region here will complete the posterior deep wall of the parotid fossa. Superiorly, the parotid fossa continues up into the area behind the temporal mandibular joint. It's a non-articular portion of the mandibular fossa and acts as the superior extent of the parotid fossa. Anteriorly, this deep wall, the anterior deep wall, is probably best marked by a fascial 
extension, again from the styloid process, which is seen in this region very nicely. This is the stylomandibular ligament. It's right here. The styloid tip is here. That ligament spans to the angle of the mandible. Above it is a membranous portion, which frequently is distended anteriorly by the parotid gland, and that's what this fossa is here. It's where the deep portion of the parotid gland fits in behind the mandible and forces that fascia, the stylomandibular membrane, forward. It's a critical relationship for dentistry because of the fact that our injection for blocking the inferior alveolar nerve is made deep to the mandible. When that penetrates, if a needle is placed too deeply or if the gland passes too far anteriorly in this fossa, it will place the parotid gland fossa extension very close to the target zone for the inferior alveolar nerve block. If the nerve block is placed in the parotid gland fossa, the contents of the parotid gland fossa are what you are going to block with your anesthetic solution rather than the inferior alveolar nerve. And it's on the basis of this anterior extension that this problem exists. So as you see, you have a fascial fossa with a superficial layer, a posterior deep wall spanning the muscles that we've mentioned, and an anterior deep wall made up of a ligament and a membrane. Superiorly, it is limited by the superior extent um, of the temporal mandibular joint, non-articular portion, and inferiorly, we have the angular tract, a fusion of the deep walls with the superficial investing fascia of the neck. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.